Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at a folklore bestiary. This is a book of monsters that are inspired by folk tales and superstitions, and it's created by the Merry Mushmen. There's two versions of it. One is for old school essentials for all of your OSR needs, and there's also a 5e compatible version if that's the edition that you play. The contents of the books is basically the same. The main difference is the stat blocks and the ways that the monster's abilities are described. So what is this book? Well, in a sense, this is the monsters that D&D forgot. D&D uh, &D was, of course, very inspired by monsters from classical mythology, but there are lots of monsters from different folk traditions around the world, especially monsters from, you know, that are more unique and are more specific to a particular place that got left out of the original D&D &D monster manuals. And this begins filling in some of those gaps. Here's what the back of the book looks like. It's all done in this very nice, very uh, great feeling hardback. The Merry Mushmen do have great production values on all of their stuff. And then you can see that there are some actual sample NPCs or PCs here at the beginning. So if you want to jump in and start playing, they have some PCs created for you. There's also some on the back cover as well over here. You can see that these are the um, characters from the cover of the 5e version. So put them together, you get six PCs. Overall, there are 38 different monsters in the book um, listed right here. And it also has it uh, broken down by hit dice all the way from half hit dice to 60 hit dice for the Serpent of Isabi. The writing was done by a variety of writers from around the world, but all of the art was done by Letty Wilson, which is actually really nice because it gives it a very coherent feel for how all of the different monsters look. The layout here is that we always start off with just the monster's name and we have a actual pronunciation guide for it, which is very helpful. For example, this is the Bachayaun, if I'm saying that correctly, and it is from the Basque country. So you always know where it comes from. And you always have a little folk tale that describes uh, the monster's background. And what's really fun about these books is that they are just a joy to read, even if you're not into d and I just love folklore in general, and it's so great to have these write-ups of all these monsters, and most of which I have never heard of before. After the write-up or the story that describes the monster, you have the stats for it. This is for old school essentials, of course, along with extra information about the monster. For example, a riddles, which is a weakness of this particular one. And you have things like adventure hooks for ways to incorporate them into a campaign and any other special abilities. Now, if you wanted to compare this side by side to the 5e version, you can see that it looks like this, where it's basically the same. There we go where the layout on this side is the same, but the monster stats are a bit different um, over on this side. They're a bit more elaborate as they tend to be in 5e. And there are definitely some monsters later on that where it takes up a lot more space just because of you know, the density of the rules of 5e. Old School Centrals is just gonna be a simpler, faster system. We've got monsters from Serbia, like the Bukavets, if I'm saying that correctly. Again, really great illustrations and lots of these little uh, notes and hooks to tie stuff in, like what floats in its domain, um, why are they here? We have like these little, um, not gremlins, gnomes, the Kab the Kabouter, Kabouter from Flanders, Belgium, which are shy diminutive gnomes who live in the low countries, always out of sight from mundane people, but never too far either. They love to drink and will gladly help someone in need in exchange for some good Abbey beer or interesting liquor. The Tartaro, or the Tartaro, but the accent should be on the first syllable, I believe, which are one-eyed ogre shepherds roaming the wild hills and mountains, kind of like the um, Cyclops from the Odyssey. Each of these types of monsters is just adorably weird and reminds me of some of the best monster manuals, a bit like um, Fire on the Velvet Horizon, which is my favorite. That one's much weirder, but um, folklore is very strange and throws curveballs at you in terms of what the monster is and why it's there and how you have to deal with it in a way that standard Dungeons and Dragons or role-playing games tend not to be. Another thing that's great about this book is that it's not just monsters, it'll occasionally throw you adventure locations as well. For example, if you actually get uh, inside this giant snail creature, there is a little mini dungeon in here that you can explore as you travel through its internal organs. We have the D-Book from Jewish Folklore. We have Bad Patchy from the Basque Country. The Green Children of Woolpit. Some of these aren't monsters so much as just strange encounters, right? These are these children that are found in a pit that are all bright green, their skin, their hair, everything about them is green. And as they are incorporated back into human society, they turn back into normal children again. 
Is that the kind of monster that you would want to fight? Not necessarily, but it does imply things about the world and about other places that you could go. Where are these children from? What is that place like? And this book helps flesh that out a bit. You have some peaceful fairies who live underground and only meddle with the affairs of mortals whose crops take over the woods. I love it when you have monsters that interact with human civilization, where there is this conflict between what humans want and what these monsters want. And uh, they just have their own motivations. And as human civilization expands, you're going to come into conflict with them. So the monsters have a reason for acting the way that they do. And there's a curse that makes them dangerous when the moon is dark. So normally they're fairly noble and upright creatures. But uh, at certain times of the year, they are extremely dangerous. Here's a great piece of art. This is the Bui Tata, and it's written by Diogo Noguera, a giant sentient serpent on whose scales the history of the world is carved. Excellent. There's a great um, hook there for your D&D games in terms of meeting this creature and learning from it. We have the Dahu. This is a really fun one. This, it's like a goat type creature. But the twist is that its legs are shorter on one side than the other, which means that on the sides of mountains, it can only go around one way or it's going to fall over. The other twist is that once you see this creature, you're only able to see it once. Every time afterwards in the future, you're not going to be able to see it. It'll be invisible or your mind will prevent you from looking at it. So in order to capture one, you need to hire, especially if you've hunted these things before, you need to hire newcomers who haven't seen one before to lure it into a trap and grab it. And then once you actually have one, not only is it delicious, but you can take its skin, which will help you be partially invisible to people who are trying to look at you. There's arms and legs that can reanimate from the corpses of dead people who were not buried properly. Jack and Irons, this one's really great. It reminds me of some of the creatures from like British mythology in Hellboy, this huge ogre that wanders the countryside of North Yorkshire and uh, a very dangerous foe to deal with, but it has its reasons for being there and it has things that were done to it that make you feel sorry for it, which is always great to have for a monster. There's the Shaka or Old Shuck, a supernatural hound that comes to the aid of some travelers, but some people say it is actually from hell. And there's a little hex crawl here that comes with it. As I said, there's little bits and pieces of adventure that help you incorporate stuff into your game. The people of the Holy City. So this is from Northern California. Great to see some weird American folklore going on where you have this cult that's out in the woods and are they undead or are they sort of undead? Regardless, you don't want to meet them in a dark night. There's the Serpent of Isipi, a 60 hit dice gigantic reptile that was killed in this story in a very OSR fashion by a, a clever youth. The Holenwagen, the Holenwagen, which is a uh, carriage from hell that can sweep through and grab your characters and drag them off to another dimension. The Krat from Estonian folklore is described as a construct made mostly of old household ingredients or implements, usually used to steal various items for its owner, but becomes dangerous when left without work, as is so often the case in folklore. Uh, we have stuff from Tang Dynasty China. There's this really great guy from North America, uh, the strange rubbery creature that lumberjacks would encounter. You try and shoot at it and things would bounce right off of it and hit you back. Wolfwalkers from Kilkenny, Ireland. Joan Delors from France. This guy's a little bit like Hercules, a man of bare strength whose strength constantly gets him into trouble. The Queen of the Fallow Field from England. We have monsters from Portugal, from uh, Shang Dynasty China again. We have the Mothman, of course, from West Virginia. The Black King from France. Oh man, the art is just so great. It's just so evocative. And I love how there's like little sketches as well. So you can see the art uh, that the artist was working on and how they developed it. There's the Knoll, which isn't really part of folklore. It's from the Book of Wonder by Lord Dunzany. We have these guys uh, in the northern marshlands, city-states field giants along with their regular troops. In times of peace, keeping them happy is not easy, but the work and expenses pay for themselves when the war comes. And war always comes in the north. I love how you have these giant mercenaries that you have to feed and keep and take care of and keep them happy for when the next battle comes. A whole adventure in here, hard times in Hamburg with a little hex crawl and room layouts. This is from a medieval manuscript, The Wonders of the East, rumored to live on an island in the Red Sea. It is a psychic humanoid whose need for human flesh and great empathy are difficult to reconcile. 
Yeah, so that's a folklore bestiary. It's really one of the more fun monster manuals that I have read in quite a while, especially if you are into folklore of any kind. It's really well put together, great art. It's built like a tank, so the thing's not gonna fall apart and should keep you entertained for quite a while. My kids are really into mythology and monsters, and I think they'll really enjoy this just for the learning about different monsters around the world, not even uh, paying attention to the D&D stats. It's also a really great demonstration of how cultures around the world thought about monsters. Monsters aren't just a scary thing that eats you in the night, although it could be that, but they're often a manifestation of part of the culture or anxieties within the culture. They are an example of problems that need to be solved. Monsters arise from an imbalance in nature oftentimes. And that's a great thing to think about when you are creating your own creatures. As usual, I will put links in the description below where you can pick this up for yourself in PDF or print form if you are so inclined. And before we go, a special shout out to all the people on Patreon who signed up to help support the channel over the last couple of months. It's been a little while. I've uh, been sick with some health problems and uh, I've just been working on Nave and it's been a little while since I made one of these videos. So thank you for sticking with me and helping to support the channel. I'll see you soon, guys. Thanks for watching.